I remember Swami Ranganath Anandaji. Some of you may have seen him. And he was the president of our order, a very, a very advanced spiritual practitioner. I mean, I got my sannyasa vows from him. Am I audible to everybody? <laughs> there was another old monk who passed away very recently. Both Ranganath Anandaji and this old monk Nirmuktanandaji. They were disciples of Mahapurush Maharaj, one of the disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. One day, when Rangaratanji was the president of our order, this other old monk, Nirmuktanandaji, walked into his room and asked him, What will become of me? And Rangaratanji replied, um, This is your last birth. I shall come again. I shall do Swamiji's work. But you do not have to be born again. So that's mukti as Hindus would understand it, moksha. Now when he told this to me, and I had heard it's common knowledge among monks there in Belurmat. And I asked Nirmuktanji directly one day. We were sitting in front of Holy Mother's temple in uh, Belurmat. Did President Maharaj tell you this? And he completed it. You know, he said, yes, I went there and asked him. And President Maharaj said all this to me. And to cut a long story short, I wanted to know uh, what a realized person feels. You know? So that's all that you would ask. Here is the river, the Ganga flowing past. Here is the temple. Here are people walking past. And does a realized person, person who is enlightened, see the all-pervading consciousness, the divinity everywhere? And he gave me certain answers. But my point is elsewhere. Then I ventured forth to ask him, do you see that now? Is this your realization now? That's what I asked him. He smiled and he said, Well, um, <coughs> it's, it's nested story within story because he told me the story of two other monks who had asked the same question. Buddhanandaji was there in Delhi and uh, Swami Jagadanand, a very senior monk, who was supposed to be an enlightened person in his own life, lifetime. So one day Buddhanandaji asked Jagadanandaji, Sir, people say you are enlightened. Are you enlightened? <laughs> and Jagadanji <laughs> sweetly smiled and said, If I say yes, will you believe me? Will that make any difference to you? I understood uh, what Nirmukhtanji wanted to say, so I bowed down to him and said, Okay, Maharaj, that's all right. <laughs> so that's the third of your questions. The first two questions are subtle. Um, but tell me, do you come from a... I mean, does non-dualism appeal to you? Yes. The path of knowledge, Vedanta? Yes. You read any Raman Maharshi or something? Mm -hmm. like? mm -hmm. All right. And I can tell you. But this, please take it very carefully. There are experiences. I'm going to deny all of this next, but that's why I'm telling you beforehand. There are spiritual experiences which are extremely valuable, definitely much superior to the experience we are having now, right now. There are. And they are worth acquiring. Yes. I'm saying all this because I'm going to deny it next. So, yes, there are. And there are spiritual states. There are. We know that there are states. We... Our waking state is a state. We all experience it. A sleep is a state. Deep sleep is another state. Dreaming is a state. Uh, there are altered states of consciousness. People have experienced these things. So there are spiritual states. There are spiritual experiences. There is no doubt about it. Many have acquired and many have experienced it. Many more are experiencing it and they will experience it in future. Having said this, all right, I'll just say it, put it very simply to you. If you have any questions, then you can ask me afterwards about that. But now the answer to your question. Enlightenment in the Advaitic sense is not a state. Enlightenment in the Advaitic sense is not an experience. Then what is it? That which comes and goes is a state. That which comes and goes is a state. The Atman, the pure consciousness is speaking about, it doesn't come and go. 
and it's not an experience because the Atman as such cannot be experienced. Now you say that, oh, so what's the point of it? You should have told me that, I wouldn't have come. <laughs> it is more than experienced. Atman is the possibility of all experience. Atman is that which makes every experience possible. All our, the experience which we are having right now, and the experience which our great sadhaka has of uh, God or visions and all, all of that is because of the Atman. The Atman, the enlightened person, knows or realizes the Atman in and through every experience. Kena Upanishad says, Pratibodha viditam matam amritattvam vindate. The one who realizes this Atman in every experience, in eating, in speaking, in talking, in walking, in meditating, in joking, in laughing, in every experience, the Atman is realized. That is enlightenment. I am not saying all of the, as I said earlier, spiritual experiences of different gods and goddesses with form, those are possible, those are extremely valuable, and we, it, it's on our path to enlightenment. But remember, they come and go. Yes. This uh, Patanjali Yoga Sutra, <coughs> the ultimate state, even today you mentioned, to come to the Samadhi state. Samadhi, is it still a state? Yes, Samadhi is a state. Because it comes, right now we are not in Samadhi. So very obviously it's a state. Temporary. Of course, some may be in Samadhi. Uh, <laughs> Uttarakhanda, Vedanta class was going on, and suddenly a sound was heard, you know, this soft, purring sound. And the teacher said, Mishra ji, kya ho gaya? Mishra ji, what happened to you? And he suddenly says, startled and, oh, tanik samadhi lag gait, a little bit of, a little samadhi, a little trance. He had fallen asleep as he was snoring. Ananda Swami told me, the early morning in Belur Madhya to meditate. And uh, the danger is always there, ever present danger of going into different states of. So he said, on one particular day, I felt my meditation was really going well today. It's really going well, uh, well today. And suddenly I felt someone, we always wear this, you know, someone hitting me with this from behind. I looked ar around and I saw this Swami who whispered sharply, sleep if you must, but why should you snore? <laughs> <laughs> he was sleeping and dreaming that he's meditating very well today. <laughs> This is the same question, and I'm also sorry to press on that. So, if we are experiencing Atman in everything, yes, it's still an experience. Uh, it's not one experience among others. It's not an experience apart from others. Swami Vivekananda puts it puts it this way, and he says it in London, in fact. He says that the Atman cannot be experienced as an experience. As I experience uh, this chair or table or something, it cannot be experienced in that way. And then he says, but wait, you must not go away with the uh, idea that it is, it is unknown. It is more than known, he says. I can put it in different ways. You see, there are wooden chairs and tables here. If you, if I say, look at it, look at the table. You say, yes, I see the table. And then tell you, look at the wood. He says, okay, I look at the wood. Is it a different experience? Well, you would say it's the same experience because you're seeing the same thing. You don't see anything new. But it's a change in perspective. And it changes in your understanding only. You're shifting your perspective. You're looking at the object, name and form, table. Name, form, function, it's table. Here is a table, it has a particular shape, it has a particular name, and a particular function, you can put the camera on that. But it is wood. If you, when you look at it as wood, um, then it's the same thing, but would you really call it a different experience? It's a realization as I think, rather than experience. That's what she's asking. Is yeah. realization an experience? It, it is realization, you know, I think. True. Yeah. Is it an experience? And Advaita no, says, finally, no, no. Uh, but the prop, moment you say it is not an experience, what happens is most people will think, oh, it cannot be experienced. So that's, what's the use? No, it's more than experienced. Therefore, uh, when, when you look at table and see wood, now when you look at the chair and the wooden paneling here, everywhere you see the same wood. 
And you saw, you've you been seeing it all through, but now you recognize it as Buddha. So it's not a new experience. But definitely it's a new way of looking at things. It's a new realization, yes. It's a new realization. The purpose is in unity. Sorry. The purpose is that there's unity in every matter. The table example and wood example um, shows that it's unity. Because uh, I often tell this to the students in my class in, in Belur Mat, the young monks who are going to be monks. I say, count the furniture here. And they count, okay, 25 benches and 25 tables. And then I say, count the substance, wood. It's only one substance, it's all wood. Now, earlier there were 25 and 25, 50 pieces of furniture. How many are there now? So one. So what did you do? Did you smash all the furniture together into a mass of wood? No, it's exactly the same as what it was. It's just a change in perspective. Now we realize there's one substance with multiple names and forms, like waves in an ocean. So that's one effect, unity. Unity or more than unity, identity. Identity is closer than unity. Yeah. I know it's a separate topic and, and a topic in itself. I want to take Bhakti Jog Sambandhi Bolun in the light of Kasambhi. I know probably it's... Mm. But I'd like... Yes. Um, however, whether it's an experience or not an experience, whether it's a state or not a state, this question and the answer to it is useful in understanding Advaita. But if you want to regard it as an experience or a state, there's no problem. Only thing is, uh, we must first be clear that it is not a state, it's not an experience. If you say it gives you a new way of looking at the world, that's a new experience. Fine, I have no quarrel with that. Because the Gyani definitely has a different way of looking at the world, of understanding and experiencing the world than we have. It's just not a new, different kind of experience. It's, it's what's already there. But there are many spiritual experiences which are new experiences. Suddenly one gets a vision of uh, light. Suddenly one gets a vision of Vishnu or Krishna. Those are new experiences. They come and go. And they are possible. So it's, it's uh, merging, is what you're saying? It is, is not it merging. It? Ah, that's a good question. It is not merging. It is, it is, uh, it's not that Brahman is something separate, you know, like a raindrop, because that kind of imagery is used. And that's correct. Even Shankaracharya uses it in Vivek Churamani. Like a rain, raindrop falling into the ocean and becoming mm -hmm. the ocean. Yes. But um, the, the, in the final analysis, you would realize that's what I always was. There was no real separation and real merging. It's not that the lion who thought he was sheep, he was, he was, a sheep and he merged back into his lion itself. It's not, not really that. It was always a lion. He recognized what, uh, what it was. And when we, when we realize that, um, from all accounts, that's what happens. It's like a veil being lifted. It's not like, I was separate, now I got merged with, it, with the oneness. The oneness was always there. It was the, the one universal ground of existence. And we recognize that. Oh, in, the, in this question of oneness, um, and um, we still go through this as, as a separate entity. We go through all these human experiences, you know, pain, suffering, yes. you know, likes, dislikes, and all those things. How do we, you know, how do we, you know, from on one hand intellectually understand we are one, but at, at, at the physical and emotional and uh, all that level? We are individual identity. How yes. do we reconcile? How do we come to transcend them? That is true. It's, philosophically speaking, the, the example of the table and the bench and the wood still apply. Even when you realize it as, as uh, it's all wood, uh, then it's still a wooden Advaita. It's not... <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's Advaita. That's, uh, but... Even after that, a bench is still a bench, a table is still a table. They look different and the uses are different. And that's perfectly fine. Even after realization of oneness or even after conviction comes that there is a, there is a hidden spiritual oneness to all of this, even after that, the differences will be exactly the way they are. And that's fine. That's the way, the way it is. Now we act on that knowledge. Earlier I was acting on the, on the basis on the assumption that we are all different. 
I am a limited being apart from you. And therefore fear comes. The first product is fear, anxiety. Um, desire comes. These are all products of separation. Um, neither fear nor desire is there where you are one. For yourself, you neither desire yourself nor fear yourself. The Upanishad says, uh, yeah, yeah, atra Who sees the slightest difference here? The first product is fear. So, we act on that knowledge. We look, we bring to bear the light of that knowledge on our day-to-day -day situations. But Vedanta has a wide range of techniques to apply, uh, of uh, approaches. It's not just the highest Advaitic knowledge. You start from, um, from a more practical level. See, fear, anxiety, desire. You know, the moment we are, we feel ourselves to be limited individual beings, we want, we feel incomplete and we want completion. And for that we act. And Shankaracharya has a equation for this. Avidya Kama Karma. Ignorance of our, of our Purnatva, of our infinite nature. Avidya. That leads to Kama, desire. Because I am not full, I am not complete. And this particular thing, this gadget, this job, mm. this person, this uh, meditation practice, it will make me complete. It never does. It hasn't worked for anybody till today. Because you already are complete. Until you know that, no amount of adding anything will, will make you complete. So, desire comes when we feel ourselves limited. Now, realizing our infinite nature and realizing we are beyond desire, we don't need anything, that's the final goal. But we can start off by seeing, at, at a much more practical level, by seeing, for example, till today, all my efforts at making myself happy, and all that I've done till my life, you know, throughout my life, is to make myself happy. When I grabbed that last piece of cake as a kid, before my brother or sister could grab it, it just was so that I could be happy. And when, as a father or a mother, I, sh I gave that last piece of cake to my children, because that would make me happy. Whether selfishly or unselfishly, altruistically, whatever we do. Now, we let us see that none of this has made me happy so far by acting for this limited body and mind. So a simple step would be to become a little less selfish. I will notice one thing. Any one single unselfish, altruistic act that we have done in our lives till today, Nobody ever has regretted it. We have never regretted any unselfish thing that we have done. <coughs> never. If I have helped somebody, said a good thing to somebody, um, been nice to somebody, today and tomorrow and year after year, when you look back upon that even, you will never regret that. You may regret anything else in the world, but something done for others without any quid pro quo, you never regret it. I often call it Seligman's experiment. Um, Professor Martin Seligman, his, uh, positive psychology. So he wanted to show this to his students in America. And one day he told his students that we will go to see this movie. No class today. The students, of course, were happy. They all went out and saw the movie and they came back. And he had a questionnaire for them. Please rate your satisfaction from zero, uh, from one to five. One, no satisfaction. Five, full satisfaction. And many of them rated it three, four or five. Next week again he says, no class. And they are very happy. Movie, sir. So no, no movie today. Today we are going out to this, this part of the town where poor families stay and we have arranged to take toys and clothes and we'll spend the afternoon with those poor kids, kids from poor families. And that's what they did. And they came back, rate your satisfaction, one, two, five, and all of them gave some, some rating, three, four, five. But the interesting thing happened six months later. Suddenly in the middle of the class he came with his questionnaires and he said, respond to this. And the question was, six months ago we had seen a movie. Rate your satisfaction about the movie now. When you look back upon that movie. And many of them said, 
I can't even remember the name of the movie. I remember vaguely we didn't have a class one day and we saw a movie. And satisfaction now, how much satisfied do you feel about that movie right now? Mm. One or two or three, not more than that, nobody. And rate your satisfaction about that afternoon we spent with those kids. Mm. And the satisfaction level was unchanged. What they had said four or five, mm. six months ago. Six months later also it was four or five. Mm. So that's a powerful learning. Though it does not, it appears to be counterintuitive. Our uh, general feeling is when I act for myself, I make myself happy. It, this is the learning that when I act for others, I make myself happy. I suppose parenthood is a training in that. You see, children are the most, unself uh, most selfish creatures in the world. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Being selfish. No, no, unselfish. Unselfish. But children are the most selfish creatures in the world. They can be suddenly unselfish, but generally, over the period of childhood, any, any parent knows. In, 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 one sec. In, in, uh, uh, in India now, there's this huge media rage about a lady who actually killed her own daughter uh, for money. And there was this, it's, it's a scandal, big scandal. And it's in all the papers and the media is making a big thing out of it. And there's, there was in one of the editorial columns, a lady has written, another lady has written about this. Well, everybody is condemning so and so for killing her own daughter, and how could and they're really saying how could a mother do this to her own child? And this lady writes, honestly, I've never met the mother who has, at one time or the other has not wished to do the same thing to the children. It made me feel like they're killing you. But parenthood is is a training in being unselfish. Same child who's so selfish, becoming a parent is basically living for the children, and it happens naturally. Now expand that beyond the limit of your own flesh and blood, your own kids and kids. The child means that something connected to this body, it's just an extension of this body. So expand it beyond that. So one practical step in the direction of that oneness, how to deal with the practical problems of life, is to be altruistic, nishkama, unselfish, rather than being selfish. Even Richard Dawkins in Cambridge, Selfish gene. Mm -hmm. People misinterpret. He writes himself. People, so he says, people misinterpret it. They, without reading my book, they say that I am telling people to be selfish. He says, no. Our genetic systems, the physical body predisposes us to be selfish. But it is the job of education and culture to make people altruistic. And I am saying altruism is extremely important for civilization. And that has to be inculcated, in fact. Okay, there's a, there's a question. Uh, okay. Um, my question is, um, you talked about uh, having the benefit of doing some kind of medica meditation or sadhana, uh, which is, I guess, is a very important step in the spiritual life. And uh, for that sadhana, um, as I understand, that meditation is one of the very important things to take us into that path. And why meditation? You talked about those eight steps of the Ashtanga Yoga. Yes. Um, but when I, I I have spoken with monks uh, in in in, uh, in various places, and one message I get uh, that is my interpretation that we are always encouraged to come to the Bhakti Yoga Pata, mm -hmm. and I even asked some of the monks that. Why don't you teach us the Raja Yoga? Mm. Because I did uh, Bhakti Yoga, Raj Yoga, and Gana Yoga, and um, by Samiti. And Raj Yoga appealed me uh, very, very much because it kind of told me that it is a way, it, it is a very scientific way, which can take me very quickly to that path. Yes. So I'm not talking about shortcutting, but I'm thinking that it kind kind of. If I merge the bhakti and the raj yoga together, my path will be much accelerated. And that's yes. that's the kind of impression I got by reading the book, sure, rightly sure. or wrongly. But when I ask this question that how do I uh, learn the raj yoga, because one of the things Swamiji has written very clearly that never try to um, practice raj without, yoga without, without a teacher. A, mm. without a teacher. And I was in search of a true, um, you know, teacher who can teach me Raj Yoga, but I, I didn't find any till now. And the kind of message I'm getting that in uh, Ramakrishna mission, that is not the preferred path. Bhakti Yoga is the preferred path, and I, I probably understand why I, when I read, uh, you know, um, Kathamrita Thakur is saying that in Kali Yuga, 
a book in part is the part, not any other. But I still. So, so you are asking I, that. I'm asking that. Is it is it right to think that in um, Ramakrishna mission that is not the way you are asking us to go, or if that is wrong, then where where I can learn that? Yeah. Or in in the mission, you the monks maybe um, I don't know whether yes, it's the yeah, right question. I you probably no, 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 the question about that. bhakti too there. Uh, and there might be other questions also related to this, yeah. You see, um, this question was asked by Krishna, or by Arjuna to Krishna in the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Which is better? A path of knowledge or the path of devotion? Path of devotion. And Krishna clearly said the path of devotion is better. But why? He says, Klesho adhikas taras tesham avyakta sattate tasam avyakta hi gatir dukkham dehavad viravakyate the, the, the path of the unmanifest, pure consciousness within, I want to realize that. He says that is difficult. The, the troubles are many on that path. And what are the troubles? I'll tell you. And, uh, and they are difficult for people, he says, Dehavad Bhiravakyate. Dehavad means those who are embodied. Now we are all embodied. Even the, even the path of a person who is pursuing the path of Jnana Yoga is also presumably embodied because without the body, why, why should anybody practice? But what he means is those whose attachment to the body is very strong, whose self-identity is strongly rooted in the body. I am this. And that's an unshakable truth for me. And I suspect it is so for most of us. Even if I... Whatever I read... When, when uh, I have a stomach ache or when I am sick or some problem comes, uh, I act, whatever I say or whatever I think, I act as if I am the body. So that shows a very deep rooting in the body. Um, what Jnana Yoga does or Raja Yoga, it does is that by our own effort, we can come to a realization of our true nature. That's the path. The peculiar appeal of Jnana Yoga and, and Raja Yoga, what you saw today, I could see many people nodding. Nodding in, in agreement, not nodding after sleep. <laughs> uh, the reason is because it's talking about something here and now which you can relate to. It's right here. If you follow carefully what the Vedanta is talking about, is talking about a fact is nothing to believe there. It, it, it's it's a reality which is present right now, and that's the appeal. It's rational, it's um, if you call it scientific, if you will, and uh, it appeals only to your understanding. It does not ask you to believe in anything, any any particular form of God, any particular religion, even. It, it's Swami Vivekananda said for this age. Vedanta is, it, it will appeal to any educated person, any rational person. He went to so far as to say this is the only religion for, for this age. Um, the problem with that, the, uh, on the other side is, that because you are thrown to your own resources, it is, we are, we, if you start practicing, after some time we will realize that, how uh, little we are capable of, how very little we are capable of. It's partly because of human weakness. And uh, on the other hand, there are the, these bhakti paths. Every religion has strong emphasis on devotion to God. You take the help of God. The disadvantage there is, it's, uh, it depends on belief. You have to start with strong belief. You are required to believe, you are required to accept, to begin with. Later it becomes as much of a fact as jnana seems right now. So, um, the Vedantic Mahavakya, the great saying, Tat Tvamasi, that thou art. Consider this carefully. All of religion is contained in that. There are two terms there. Tat Tvam. Tat means God, that. There's a very neutral term for God, that. The English that and Sanskrit that, they mean the same thing. That. And Tvam means you. Thou art that. Now, 
there are religions which are entirely concerned with the tat, the that. So in Hinduism you find Vaishnavism, Shaivism, Shaktaism, worship of the Divine Mother, worship of Shiva, worship of um, Narayana, all these forms, they are heavily concentrated on Tat Padartha. The Sanskrit is called Padartha, Tat Padartha in Advaita Vedanta. And uh, the advantage, there are advantages to that and disadvantages. The advantage is God has no problems. God is infinite. God is all-powerful. Only problem is you have to believe. God is, Tat means, they say in Sanskrit, Paroksha. It is not uh, empirically evident. It, it's not immediately obvious. You have to make a conscious decision to believe. So, Paroksha. Tat Padartha. Tvam, you. There are certain religions. So, uh, not only in Hinduism. You find the Tat Padartha approach in Islam, in Judaism, in Christianity. They are entirely oriented Godwards. In those uh, approaches, who am I is not a, an important question. I am searching for God. And there are these other religions, the Tvamparat, the Thou-oriented religions, or I-oriented religions. Buddhism. You see, they never talk about God. The whole thing is directed inwards. And discovering the truth inward through meditation. So Buddhism. Even the Buddha in certain forms of Mahayana Buddhism, where Buddha is worshipped, the aim is not to get a vision of the Buddha. The aim is the Buddha helps you to get Nirvana. So, they are entirely oriented on the self and realizing the no-self doctrine or whatever, the way they put it. Jainism. They do not talk about a worship of a, of a god. It's the liberation of the self which they are interested in. In Hinduism, you have Raja Yoga, this is Patanjali Yoga, which is the freeing of the self. God, there's God in the self system of yoga, but in the system of yoga, God is a, 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 he's a much reduced God. Uh, God is a teacher. He is the Adi Guru and is a teacher. He helps you in realization. Sankhya in Hinduism is again related only to the self. So now, and the advantage of this path is as against the other path. In this path. You don't have to start with the belief. You see, in uh, Christianity or in certain schools of Hinduism, uh, the, the question of, should I believe in God? In the sadhakas will always have a problem once in a while. They have a doubt. Does God exist? So that kind of doubt will come in the path of sadhana, in the, in the path of tat padartha. In every religion you find this in the lives of the great saints and of the people who have struggled to find God. In these paths, um, there is no doubt that I exist, only even in Buddhism. They don't say that I don't exist. It's just the nature of the I they are investigating. The nature of the I is no self. It's, an, uh, it's a continuous changing mass which is mistaken for a permanent self. So, in, in this path, there is no doubt that I exist. There is no question of any God to believe in and nobody doubts that one I exist. So, there is no question of starting with belief uh, in Sankhya, in in, Raj, in Patanjali Yoga. That's the appeal of Patanjali Yoga because everything is set out in this way. You do this, you'll experience this. You do this, you'll experience this. And you don't have to believe in anything particular. You only have to believe to the extent that if I do this, I'll, have, I'll get this experience. That much. Is, we do not have a teacher. Uh, yes, I'll come back to that. And um, so this is the advantage. The disadvantage of this path is, yes, I know I exist. But that doesn't solve any problem. That's in fact the problem because I have so many sorrows. So God exists. I have, I have doubt about his existence. It's difficult to believe. But he has no problem. He or she has no problem. I have no doubt that I exist. But I have lots of problems. <laughs> so there are advantages and disadvantages of both paths. And what Advaita does is, this is a unique insight. It throws these two together. With the advantages of both and the disadvantages, uh, without the disadvantages of either. How does it accomplish that? It says what you are in reality, the pure consciousness which we spoke about today, that is free of all those problems. And that is God. So, that pure consciousness, if you understand it carefully, there is no question of disbelieving in that or disregarding it because we, it, it's quite obvious something like that is there. 
and if that is God, then in, the, in Vedanta, in Advaita Vedanta, the question of whether God exists or not is not a problem at all. In Uttarakhand, asked uh, Swami, Ishwar ki astittu me akatya praman dije. Give me an in, irrefutable proof for the existence of God. An irrefutable proof. If you know Christian theology or Nyaya theology in Hinduism, you know there are pramanas, Ishwara pramanas or uh, Saint uh, uh, Aquinas's, Thomas Aquinas's proofs of the existence of God. But they are all, if you don't know, you are not missing anything. Because if you read those proofs, you will know it, will, it won't convince anybody. If you are convinced, you will be happy. If you are not convinced, the, it won't convince you. But here is the question. Give me a proof which cannot be refuted that God exists. And the answer was immediate. Brother Swami was an Advait and he said, Tumhara apna astitva, your own existence is the existence and proof of God. And it makes sense in Advaita because that existence at the core of that, that is God itself, according to Advaita Vedanta. That is, that is literally God. Now coming back to your question. These are the different approaches there. Now, the difficulties, you know, that when we take up the path of Raj Yoga, the very basic disciplines, Yama and Niyama, restraint of the senses, even Advaita Vedanta, we talk, we may talk so much about pure consciousness everywhere, but you know where the problem comes? Next, once they say, are you convinced about it? Yes. Now what do I do? And they will tell you, live your life accordingly. <laughs> live your life accordingly. You are not allowed to be upset under any condition. One Swami put it humorously. Whatever the setup, you cannot be upset. <laughs> and that's terribly difficult. <laughs> you are not allowed to be upset. Swami Vivekananda says, he prepared a beautiful note on the four yogas. Jnana, Bhakti, Karma and Dhyana. Raja Yoga. Maybe somebody asked him. It's in the complete works. And there, at the end, he talks about Jnana Yoga path of non-dualism, of knowledge. And he says, in this path, many come to an understanding, few realize. And he says, this path, you would say, what does Jnana Yoga consist of? If you ask us, our answer would be, well, based on what the Swami said, it consists on analyzing yourself and realizing yourself as pure consciousness, holding on to that and acting like that in life and so on and so forth. Swami Vivekananda says, this path consists chiefly in the control of the senses. You wouldn't think that, you know. Mm -hmm. Talking so much about pure consciousness and all that. Mm -hmm. But ultimately it comes down to this. The senses run outwards to the world and we react to uh, things in the world outside, the way people behave, react to our own emotions. All of this, you have to be detached from it as a witness. Mm -hmm. And all of these have to subside. It's not at all easy. Even the li little bit we try, it's a terrible struggle. Ramanu Acharya comes in there, Vishishta Dvaita, and he says, see, what Krishna is telling us is, realization, the preliminary condition for realization is control of the senses, Indriya Nigraha. And then he tells us, it is only the Sthita Pragya, the enlightened one who can control the senses. Now he says, <coughs> Krishna has put us in a vicious circle. Without perfect discipline, you cannot realize God. You cannot be enlightened. If you are not enlightened, you cannot have perfect discipline. Then, then he says, Jnana, Nishtha, Dushprapya. Ramanujacharya says, It's impossible to be established in this path of knowledge. Then what's the way out? Ramanuja says, There bhakti helps. Bhakti is love, emotion. You yoke your emotions, that which runs out towards the world, to God. Believing in God, the existence of God, and Advaita helps you to believe in God because um, if that divinity within is there everywhere and that is God. Krishna says, the consciousness within everybody, that, that's who I am and that's God. If that's true, then it must be there. And that is what we worship as if we are separate. When I pray to God, it is there. It, it's a, it's a, an undeniable fact. When I, when I f make my love flow to that God, Love is so powerful that it pulls everything else along. You see, what is the problem with uh, in spiritual life, as Swami in the Himalayas said, the problem is not in our intellect. 
The intellectual problem is easily clarified. If you read a few books of Vedanta, attend a few classes, you will begin to get a good idea of what the Upanishads are saying. It's not very difficult. But what is difficult is that which pulls us to the world and that which gives us pain and suffering in the world is not rooted in our intellect. It's rooted in, in Sanskrit, in our prana, in our heart, in our desires and emotions. That's what is pulling us, not lack of understanding. Jnana operates, knowledge operates at the level of the intellect. Bhakti operates at the level of the prana, of the emotions, of the mind. You know, where our mind dwells, not on what we understand, on what we love. Our mind generally tends to dwell on what we love, what we want, not what we understand. Krishna says again and again, Mayar Pita Mano Buddhi. Submit or, or focus thy intellect and thy mind on me. Why thy intellect and thy mind? I may have decided with my intellect, God exists, I am Brahman and everything is clearly decided. And then lock it up in a vault and go on doing whatever I was doing in the world out there. Throughout the day, if I ask, do I ever think that I am Atman? Do I ever think that God is everywhere? No. My buddhi says yes. My intellect has decided this. But I, I spend day after day without thinking about God. So mind is not on God. It's quite possible. So mind will be on God. Meditation depends on the mind, not on so much on the buddhi. Mind will be on God when, when the mind wants God. And that's why bhakti comes in. So therefore in the path of meditation in the Ramakrishna mission, those who are, you are initiated, you know, there is an element of meditation, Raja Yoga elements are there. There is an element of Tantra. The mantra Shastra is there. There is an element, powerful element of Bhakti. And there is a powerful element of Jnana also. Though we do not emphasize that ma much, but if you read um, Swami Saradananda Ji, the great master and all, so when he talks about what, what happens when we meditate in that way, I'll put it to you in a very simple way, the way I think. We all have the capacity to understand Jnana. We all have the capacity to feel Bhakti. We all have the capacity to do things, Karma. We all have the capacity to focus, Dhyana. Why not use all of it? Why play off one, one path against another? Why should I say that? No, I want to do it only by Advaita. I want to do it only by meditation. You can. Swami Vivekananda says it is possible. By knowledge, by meditation, by work, or by love, by mo mo one or more or all of these, you be free. That's the whole of religion. We have all these capacities. These are all cognitive capacities. I mean, these are cognitive, affective and uh, cognitive fa faculties in a human being. So we have these faculties.